It's time for fun, learning, commentary, laughs, and more. Care of the most diverse group in the genealogy and family history world. Welcome to Black Pro Gen Live with your hosts, Nika and True, and the baddest panel in these pedigree streets Angela, James, Linda, Alex, Ellen, Tony, Shelly, Teresa, Bernice, Felicia. Willie, Renata, and Tasia. It's Black Pro Gen Live, genealogy, family history research with flavor. Hello and good evening, everyone. Oh, I'm so excited. Welcome back. It is Tuesday, the 8th of January, and it is 2019. And we are so happy to be back for season five. This is our 74th episode, and we are here. And if it's your first time or you're returning back home here to Black Pro Gen, we just want to welcome you. My name is True Lewis, and I'm going to be your host for the evening. And before I introduce our host, on behalf of myself and the panelists of Black Pro Gen, we just want to give you, you know, a virtual rouse and applause, Nika. She is our host, and we just want to thank you for bringing us all back together again. It's just, it's just an honor to do this. You have us all in one place and have us in a home. So we just want to welcome you back. So with further ado, I'm going to welcome back our sister in genealogy and your host, Nika Smith. That was really sweet. Thank you. I was not even expecting that. <laughs> we are a crazy bunch. Can't you see? Look, we're so excited and bright and shiny. We've, we've updated our photos. That means you probably should do the same. Thanks so much for joining us, you all. Happy New Year. It is time for Season 5 of Black Pro Gen Live and tonight's topic for our 74th show. So you've done a great job finding your ancestors, but you're not sure where to start to try to locate their living descendants. In tonight's episode, we'll cover tips and tricks you can use to safely and respectfully unearth the identities of your living cousins. Thanks for joining us for episode 74, reverse genealogy, DNA, and tracing the living. If you have a question or comment, be sure to join the conversation now. Participate in the live chat taking place on YouTube at the top right hand of the screen if you're watching on a computer and at the bottom of the YouTube app on your mobile device. You can also weigh in on Twitter by tweeting us at Black Pro Gen and using the hashtag Black Pro Gen. And if you've ever missed the show and you couldn't believe that you did, here is your reminder to set reminders. All you need to do is head to the YouTube page and click set reminder under the episode you're interested in. They're loaded all the way up until I believe June or so, or you can just subscribe to the channel and each time we go live or videos uploaded, you'll get a reminder in your inbox. And here is what you all have been waiting for for the longest time. You now can purchase Black Pro Gen Life merch. So many of you have asked us, I want a t-shirt, I want a mouse pad, I want a laptop sleeve, I want a backpack, I want an all over print hoodie or whatever. Here's your opportunity to get your Black Pro Gen Live merch. Go ahead and head to that Google short link that's right there. We'll also post it in the chat room so that you can get your sweatshirt, your all over shirts, all sorts of stuff. Yes, there is merch, Tom Reed. He said, what? <laughs> yes, there is merch. You can get it. In fact, you'll see some of the panelists sporting it tonight. You can get uh, there's everything there from laptop sleeves, mouse pads, to messenger bags, to everything. It's very distinctive, just like we are. And that's exactly why we're offering it. So we will. <laughs> <laughs> Tom Reed's comments in the chat room are cracking me all the way up. He's like, this is so dope. We will be sure to post the link in the chat room. The panelists have actually said that I'm trying to bankrupt them with items because there's so much stuff that they want to get. So um, yeah, be sure to get your Black Pro Gym Live merch. It's great. So, all right, everybody. Hey, what's up? 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 H
what's going on? Panelists, come off mute, introduce yourselves, let everybody know where you're coming from. I'm sporting my Black Pro Gen Life all over sweater, sweatshirt, it's a ladies version. Got our little mic on the front. On the back is a marriage license during reconstruction for formerly enslaved people. You know, we had to do that, had to represent my third great grandparents right there. All right, let's go to the person fur uh, furthest up north, Teresa Vega. Teresa Vega, uptown near the boogie down, got the, got the shirt on. Hey, so you see it there? Um, love this and um, welcome back. Happy New Year. It's going to be a good one. Looking forward to uh, uh, sharing new information, new merchandise. Hey, um, Happy New Year, people. Let's go furthest out west to our friend in genealogy and my bay, my spirit animal, Alex Trap Chabula. You know, every time you say that, I just like, I just get so warm inside. I, I've been loving you since I was like 14, Nika. Uh, <laughs> I am so happy to be back on season five of Black Pro Gen Live. And I'm so happy to be on this episode with you guys. And I'm looking forward to hearing from the rest of these experts on this panel and sharing what I know with all of you. All right, all right. Let's go to our Show Me State representative, our lovely, gorgeous friend and lover of Smashbox beauty products, Linda Sims. <laughs> I'm the lover of makeup, period. <laughs> uh, hi, everybody. I'm Linda Sims from St. Louis and also Mississippi Rooted. And I am also sporting my shirt tonight. And Happy New Year to you all. All right. Our favorite college student in the whole mm -hmm. wide world, who is in my favorite place of all places, New Orleans, our baby, Willie Russell IV. Hey everybody, Willie, originally from Oakland, but here representing New Orleans. Right, and last but not least, our co-host here with her Happy New Year headband. <laughs> <laughs> and her red glasses tonight. She wanted to shut set it off. And look, you guys, she actually put her banner up. Yes, finally, it's not out on the showcase, but I'm here from Kentucky, uh, built by Bama, Roll Tide. I'm still with my boys. <laughs> oh, they got the break shoes beat off of them last night. I'm sorry. I, I, I didn't even watch. I didn't even watch, but I heard my husband and the other one going, woo! Now, you know, it's bad when somebody does that. And that's what he did last night. I was hurt. I was hurt. I woke up hurt, but I'm good. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I got my Black Pro Gen live shirt, too. She and a whole bunch new. of stuff over there. But right. this is All like, right. OK, hold it up. Hold, hold it up. It. Yeah, <laughs> we are. We are having a great time, you all. We have had a great hiatus. It's been so wonderful. We want to make sure we welcome everyone in the chat room. Neff Hawthorne, our buddy, Vicki Davis Mitchell, Kristen Clegg, Bernice Bennett is in the chat room holding down for panelists along with Renata Yarborough Sims and Felicia Addison. Um, Cecilia Matoya Charles, thanks so much for joining us. Mm -hmm. Charlotte Char Chatfield, Diana James Winder, you guys are great. Zel Miss Zelda, hey girl, how you doing? Thanks so much for joining us. Denise Muhammad, who is always here along with Jessica Trotter. We love you. Tom Reed from Family Search. I love your, your expressions. You're hilarious. We are hollering, laughing at you. Tonight's subject matter, man. Okay, we spend so much time on dead people that I think a lot of times people don't even think or focus on trying to find living folks. And I believe that DNA has actually flipped that on its head because you can't do genetic genealogy successfully without knowing who the living people are, right? Or you'll be forced to identify the living people as a result of knowing who the dead people are because you're trying to figure out how you're related. So it's very, um, it's super timely um, for us to be having this conversation, especially in light of everything that's been going on in the news with regard to privacy and just all sorts of other stuff when it comes to living people and their ties to genealogy. So the first question I have for the panelists tonight is, during what part of your journey um, or during what part of the journey should a researcher begin to search for living relatives? I have an answer to that. Um, one of the things that I know when I started researching was that I had little information about my ancestors. So that meant that everyone around me needed to fill in those blanks. So start the very first basis of doing research is starting with what we know. I feel like that's where we get that information from. Now researching downwards, that's another story. 
Okay. Anyone I, else going to chime in? Well, I, I'll chime in. For me, uh, uh, piggybacking off what Nika said, um, when I first started doing genealogy, it was traditional genealogy. DNA has changed that. So uh, my buddy and my cousin, uh, my homie friend in the chat room, Christine Varner, um, I actually, through my research uh, and, and making public all the DNA finds I made and with the cemetery issue, I actually started reaching out to uh, organizations and then they put me in touch with my cousins who turned out to be my DNA cousins. And then from there, um, it, it's just expanded outwards. So I tend to um, probably at the DNA part, reach out to, I reach out to all my matches and I'm, I, I don't worry about who doesn't respond. It's the people who do respond that we've been able to move forward uh, in finding our shared history. So it, it just depends. But um, once I locate a community in the past though, and write about it, of course, my hope has always been that we reunite families um, based on, on just the regular historical record. So it's all about reaching forward, bringing people back and, and reuniting them with their ancestors for me. What about you, uh, Linda? I was just rich. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I was like, Linda, he's trying it. I was uh, gonna say, when I first started doing genealogy, of course, we all go looking for the dead people. But um, as you uh, learn to do genealogy more, you know you have to start with yourself and work backwards. And I agree with Teresa, when DNA became uh, came on the scene, it became more popular. And you start finding relatives that opened up a whole nother world for us. Willie, true? I, I have to agree with um, Alex. I think that's the first thing that I would start off with. Well, that's what I start off with, was trying to talk to living relatives, especially the ones that you knew. And then that way they lead you to relatives that you may have not known that are still living. So that's one way that I used. And you know what, to piggyback also on that too, I miss those opportunities to talk to uh, those that were around me. So now I'm relying on um, the research, the paper trails, and the DNA to fill in the blanks that I didn't capitalize on when my ancestors were alive. Mm, I like I like how you phrase that, that I didn't capitalize on. Mm -hmm. Because I think early on, people sort of like, they kind of discount the folks who were still living, right? Mm -hmm. Unless it's somebody who's like 172 years old and who still lives in the town and works at the courthouse. You know what I mean? Like somebody's right. gotta be like a ticket item for people to like really, really like say, hey, like I need to interview, I need to go visit, I need to collect obituaries or documents or whatever. And so the, I think that statement is, is, is really impactful because it's allowing the rest of us to realize and just say like, don't forget about the living people. Like they're right. an asset. And even if they don't know the name of the last slaveholder, they know the names of additional family members that you may not know of at this particular point in time. So don't ever count them out. Um, do you, True, what about you? When did you, what, during what part of the journey you think of do a, that a researcher should start to look for living relatives? Well, I guess everybody already said, but I al always started from the beginning, even when I was just doing this back in 98. Cause I'm always going to just ask. That's the first thing you're going to do is just talk to who is living to, mm -hmm. you know, to find the other living people. But I've noticed over the years, that's what I've been doing is, you know, just talking to them. And I, and I do go back over my old research and find other things to, you know, from the dead to, go back and find the, uh, the people here that are living now. So, Believe it or not, you all, I did not start at the beginning with contacting living people. I had to though. <laughs> I, I didn't, I was yeah. in my own little silo. I mean, outside yeah. of like family reunions and stuff like that, like I mm -hmm. didn't actively see like search out living people. Mm -hmm. I often tell this story when people ask me, mm -hmm. you know, when did the bug, when did I really know that I was meant to do this was when I, and a cousin passed away, he was a second cousin of mine. And I said, you know, oh, she's dying. It was she, you know, I lived in the Bay area and her funeral was in Stockton. Right. So it wasn't like I couldn't drive. I told a cousin, OK, just grab a program for me. And I hung up the phone. And then I was like, but that's my cousin, too. 
Mm. Yeah. Why but can't I, I go? Right. So yeah. I had never driven there before in my life. This is before we had GPS on your phone when you used to have to print out MapQuest with your directions. Yeah. <laughs> and I went. And after that, I was like, you know what? I'm going to be fearless about this now. Because if I stay in my own silo and if I stay to myself and I don't reach out to living people, I'm missing the I'm missing opportunity. The cousin that passed, I never got a chance to meet her. The first time I saw her in my life, she was laying in a casket. Mm-hmm. So don't be me. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Be the the Ivories will tell you that's how I started. I looked them up in the phone book and dial 411 back then when we were out in Seattle. And they'll always tell you that story how I called up anybody that had an Ivory last name. And then they got me up with the person that was going to be in the next reunion. So in 2003, it took me two years. I just kept calling and talking to different family members. And I got to meet so many people, even though it was over 200. I had like in that two year span had that like 15 close people that I stayed in touch with for two years till we got there. And one of granddaddy Ike's 23 kids was still living at that point. Mm. And and Nika, I would, I would add, you know, everything that you said when I, I'm, I'm, I'm someone who was raised by their elders who love to talk, 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 talk. And I just grew up with those stories. So for me, uh, it's always been talking to the oldest people in the in the family. And from there, you know, we I come from a, a area where everybody knew we were related, but not how. So it's it's basically going back and tracing those ties that bind, which leads you to more relatives. Um, and then uh, uh, it just, it, it snowballs from there. And so I was blessed, for example, to find my cousin Helen at 98. And the first thing uh, she said is, I can die in peace now. I'm like, no, I got to get you to 100. So we had a blessing. But that discovering her brought us into a, a, no, a whole new line of my second, of my second great grandmother's other sister that we had lost contact with. So now we have this new line, they're included and, and, and all the pieces are coming together. And then going forward, whatever I discover is about uh, uh, resurrecting these communities. So, you know, talk to your older people and then and start there, which is the way most of us started, yeah. And when you say talk to the older people, we can't forget the neighbors. And, That's true. Uh, yeah. Can't yeah. forget those neighbors were family. <laughs> Na- I was gonna say neighbors and friends, though, because mm-hmm. if you, yep. you know, if you're social, we we've talked about social groups, mm-hmm. um, churches, things like that. Those mm-hmm. are folks that you reach out to, especially if you have a number of of your elders that have passed away. By the time you actually get the bug mm-hmm. to start doing genealogy consistently, so that's something that's something also to think about. Do you all think that? Uh, genetic genealogy has accelerated the need and the timeline to develop the skill to find living people. I, I, I would I say think, yes. Yeah, I think yeah, so. it, has. it has. And well, I, I, I think it has. And and if we all got over the fear factor about reaching out to all our DNA cousins, mm-hmm. uh, and not what not worry if they don't respond, they don't respond. Don't get just just focus on continually reaching out. And uh, you know, that that just opens up so many possibilities. Um, of uh, making contact. So I, I routinely uh, find myself educating people by just having, I don't put everything on Ancestry, but I have a public tree because I want people to be able to, to, to just see how we could possibly connect and I with them. So at points, you know, I'm the one who is providing info, but many times I go back and, and, I don't have a problem educating people either. I go back and I and I see this break where there's a, a, a possibility that this is, if you follow this line, this is how we match. We don't know exactly, but we can find out a lot. So I just want everybody to reach out and don't worry, just keep working it. All right, all right. So what are the initial steps you take to track down living descendants of your ancestors? Everybody has a different process. I have my own little process. I'll I'll save mine to the end because I'm a little... I, I personally do not feel like people use public records. And I'm not talking about... Vi- um, 
people search and stuff like that because I think I think the average person who's doing a lot of genetic genealogy who's trying to track down folks maybe especially if you have matches who are not responding or you don't know if they've gotten your messages or whatever some people will use those public sites but I don't think enough folks actually utilize services that we pay for as taxpayers mm -hmm. do you wait a minute people might not know what I'm talking about mm -hmm. uh, there's a service we pay for as a taxpayer that's public information where we're if you're doing good research you're already heading to these places right in fact our next episode is talking about a research trip so many people don't look at public records as in the county that your potential family members live in i'm talking same thing you look at for your ancestors land and property transactions marriages the majority of the counties in the united states now some in the south y'all know we don't have money like that yet or we ain't mm. we ain't up to snuff but the major locations and even some smaller ones their clerks of court are online they have searchable databases in fact are you looking for people in maryland did you know that all of the maryland clerks are on one site and it's free mm. including historical stuff and that's a service we as taxpayers, whether you are going and getting a, a, some potato chips at Walmart or you own a house and you're paying property taxes, your money is going towards these services so that things are documented and our government can run. But a lot of people don't even think about these services. Clerks of court, right? Tax assessor, right? How many times have I looked at, at the tax records in the state of Louisiana and search the legal land descriptions for plantation names. So I can find out where, where the stuff is now. Oh, y'all didn't know? Okay, maybe y'all didn't know you can do that. Hey, city oh, directories. Yes, yes. Yes. Right. City directories, phone books, right? What what are initial steps, right? So we talked about talking to known family members, having them connect you to other people. But what other things, right? I talked about people using things like people finders to see yes. if you can yeah. get an address. Um, me personally, I actually like that US uh, public uh, directory that mm -hmm. goes up to 2002 on Ancestry. You're like, why do you like a database that's like, what, 16 years old? Because the old folks on there ain't gonna change that number. Right. <laughs> exactly. If you are calling somebody over 75 or really over 60, mm -hmm. that home number is not changing. In fact, their parents probably had it. And then when they took the house over, they got the number after the parents. Now, the yeah, area code may have changed. You might want to see, based on the city, go to the National Area Code. See, I'm giving y'all all my tips. <laughs> go to the National Area Code Association and find out what the area code is because it may have changed. Cell phones have made, you know, area codes go obsolete much quicker, much more quickly. But those old folks are not changing that home number. They're not. What other what are the initial steps you all take to try to find and what are the resources um you know that's what you talk about? Mm-hmm. Vital mm -hmm. records. But yeah. you also got social media sites. Yes. Um, yeah. um you also <laughs> have those search engines like Intellis.com is one and white pages that yeah. is online. Yeah. And even even if you know where a person kind of live, that you I mean uh sort of live, you can look at the county government site. And see where their property is. You were talking about property, Nika. Mm -hmm. Very true. Very mm -hmm. true. One of the things, just to piggyback off of the social media. So, um, in, in one of my biggest projects, which is on the Noble family coming out of New Orleans, um, I made it my point to try to connect as many descendants as possible. And of course, so I um, first started adding folks on Facebook that I knew were descendants of Jordan Noble. Um, and then it turned out, okay, well, this person's going to be friends with their daughter, their brother, their niece, nephew, and them. So I went and added all them up. And of course, they're like, who is this big eared high school boy in California that we never heard of with all these pictures of my mom and them? Why is he adding us? So then, of course, people started to ask questions. I'm asking questions. I'm like, here's my number. I didn't call them and their moms 10,000 times. So I made a Facebook group. So the more people that I added to it, they would add their friends or you know their closer relatives into it. And then it grows and grows and grows. And we began to exchange information, photos, um, actual copies of, of documents that I wouldn't have had access to here in California and they're down in New Orleans. And we have to think this is 
during the recession. This is before a lot of things were digitized, especially pertaining to our people. So that was a huge benefit in, in my research and in this project that I'm working on to this day. We're over 10 years later and we're still, this Facebook group is now at 400 plus members of descendants. So. Mm -hmm. And, and Shelly in the chat room just mentioned newspapers. I'm a big fan of newspapers, current newspapers, old newspapers. I dig them up uh, and find out. I can't tell you how many uh, gold mines I found there. Mm -hmm. And if we're talking about social media, if you are a solid researcher, you already know to go to that about page of that person. Yeah. Because in the early days of Facebook, folks got into the habit of listing siblings mm -hmm. and other family members. And sometimes that can help you connect how people are related, especially let's say you have two DNA matches. They are separate accounts, right? One is not managed by the other. Usually if you're looking at an account and you can see that it's managed by somebody else, you can pop those two accounts open in different windows and f figure out how those two people are related. So then that way, you know, you can say, okay, on this side of their families, how I connect now I have to find out what, what where my side comes in. But let's say those, those two accounts are separate and you know they're connected and, and maybe the person uses their username. If you find them on Facebook, go to their about page, then you can see, okay, this is their sister, this is their mom, right? People got into the habit of doing that and I had forgotten about it. And I was, I, I had a whole bunch of folks listed as cousins to me. And I was like, well, if somebody couldn't find me or if I wasn't open, they this would be an easy way to figure that out. But that's definitely an area, um, I will admit, depending on how, how savvy you get at this, if a person doesn't have relationships listed, you can also look through photos. Mm-hmm. Because people are very, um, they, they celebrate. This is, we're in a culture now where we celebrate mon, like milestones, right? If you have a, like when my father passed away, usually on every April 2nd, I post something about my dad. A memory, whatever it is, on my father's birthday, September 26th, I usually post something, right? Depending on a person's profile settings, and some of this stuff may be private, or I love when you try to find a DNA match and they have people in common with you. Mm. And, you know, another I'm looking at what Angela put in here is they have a hometown page. So sometimes when you can't find someone, click on the hometown, see if there's a, uh, for me, I'm always looking at Chickasaw County, Mississippi, see if there's a homepage for that. And also Bernice mentioned blogs. Mm -hmm. That's real. Mm -hmm. Blogs. I, go ahead. Go ahead, Alex. Can I describe a step by step um, of how I do it? So yeah, that's um, exactly what I want. Go I ahead, am, baby. Like am, the cart, the floor is yours. Thank you. So <laughs> I'll just say this. So say for instance, so my um my great grandfather was born in 1919, passed away in 95. In in 95 in um Vallejo, they published a really. I'm mad at my family to this day. They published the shadiest. Um, obituary that literally said like no names, New Orleans, Second Baptist, you know, that was it. So, but his, <laughs> you know, it's like, it's like, what can I do with this? Right. But, um, but his, you know, his sister passed away in, in 2002. Uh, my Dorothy pretty much raised me at times. She passed away in 2002 and we ran obituaries both in Vallejo and in New Orleans. And the New Orleans obituary was far more detailed, but what I would do, so taking, um, I didn't grow up with my Aunt Dorothy's descendants. I didn't know her kids, her grandkids, nothing. Um, so what I do when I'm researching, say, you know, my Aunt Dorothy was born in 1920. So she passed away in 2002. Um, on her obituary, it listed her children and then it listed grandchildren. And it also listed, you know, friends and relatives of her, but that are part of this school, this school district, this church, this woman's board, this whatever the case is. Um, so what I would do is I would take those names, you know, the, the the daughter, the son, whatever the name is. Oftentimes in obituaries, if we understand the structure, sometimes they'll have the the in-laws connected to it. And then they'll say, you know, the kid's name. Sometimes they'll leave out the last name of the grandkids or the kids, whatever the case is. But what I do almost immediately, if, a, if someone died anytime between 95 and 2019, now we're in 19, I look on those grandkids because they're going to have social media, most likely. And I pull them up and I find them. I'm friends with like half of Black New Orleans. So I know <laughs> that at least, at least yeah, I'm related to everybody. So it's like at least somebody going to be a mutual and they can link me. Um, so shout out to all my New Orleans and, and Louisiana Creoles out there that's watching. But literally, that is my step-by-step. -step. I always go to Facebook first and then I go on whitepages.com. 
and I pull up, try to pull up their, their phone numbers. Those numbers in New Orleans ain't changed. That 504 is very real. And then I call and then they're like, mm, who are you? Oh, whose grandchild are you? Oh, you're Warren's grandchild. Okay, we got you. And then boom, family connections are built. And, and, you know, and then you go from there, but that's kind of my step by step. Um, and then if I say, for instance, I can't find an obituary, I'm looking at those city directories. I'm looking at on family search. I love family search for this because they have that list of other people associated. I'm looking at them too. And I'm reaching out to them just as well. Um, yeah. I, I love got, obituaries. Got, okay. Go yeah. ahead. I was about to say, go, go, uh, true. What were you going to try? I, I, got I got something to say about obituaries in the times. Picking you. Yeah. Hey, <laughs> hey, whoever the obituary person is at the times pick you. I just want to, I just want to declare a blessing over your life right now in the name of our Lord and savior, because they are so formulaic here. We, we hardly ever talk about genealogy bank and I just have to put this plug in for them. If you have Louisiana research and I'm talking Baton Rouge and new Orleans, along with even little rock, Arkansas and surrounding communities, you need to be searching genealogy bank for obituaries, which will help you find living people. The time speaking unit is so formulaic. You're going to have a list of all the people who have the obituary first. Then they're going to do the paragraph for the people. It starts off, it'll tell you if what time they died, where, then it goes into the family members, associated family members. And then after that is a paragraph of affiliations. Those are your social groups, your churches, all that kind of stuff. Then following that, it will tell you when the services are, and then it will say who is in charge of the body. Alex, um, am I lying? You are not lying because you got all your, you got your, you know, in New Orleans. We are going way off track, Nika, but we you sure got your, are, but, but this that, episode but that, is on June 25th. Because <laughs> everything that you broke down is why you, it's why you need those obituaries. And That's Linda, you bring up a great point about the funeral home sites. Anytime mm -hmm. I hear a death of somebody in my family, I'm searching for their name as a Googleable term and the term funeral or memorial service. Why? Because I don't know who the mortuary is. And the mortuary nine times out of 10 has a website that is hosted by Legacy that posts an obituary yes. that tells mm -hmm. you when the service is and has all that other stuff. Because people don't typically put printed obituaries and newspapers anymore because it's too expensive so they'll just usually go through the mortuary true what were you gonna say i just had to put that out there i had to <laughs> shout out that times picking you staff because they're the bomb <laughs> yeah I've, I've heard all the suggestions and you know all the tips and the tricks but i do follow pool funeral home and i know it's probably been mentioned out in the chat room but i follow them i get emails every day for, for Birmingham obits because I'm always looking for those surnames. But there is one thing I have been doing for a while, and that's my Google alerts. Um, that led me to a living cousin that was a coach in a specific town with my surname, which I'll just say is Swagger. <laughs> and once I got to um, talk to him it led me to other things. So I keep a, like about 10 alerts on different things, like for Alabama, PA, and Georgia. And of course I do ivory. So that can lead you to articles or other things that come up, you know, whether they're living or gone or just town news. So go in there up in Google if you use it and you can set alerts for certain um, keywords. I'm, I'm going to go ahead and show this to everybody so yeah. they so they know where this is. That was um, my secret. <laughs> yeah, oh, so you got to sleep it out the bag. Yeah. Now, this is something um, that I do for me. I want to know who is mentioning my name and when they're mm -hmm. saying it and how they're referring to it, just because I'm I just need to make sure you ain't saying nothing crazy about me. Um, <laughs> But also because this is, uh, what is this? Google.com forward slash alerts, okay? you I have 23 alerts. You see some of these are, you know, African-American family history. Uh, you see I have Agsnick in here, Willie and and mm -hmm. uh, and Alex. Ancestral Project, any atlasfamily.org, Black History, uh, call for papers for family history. Let's say there's a conference I want to speak at and I want to email, right? Because I may miss when they when they announce these things. You can set up an alert for anything and then it you can determine when you want it to come to you. See? How often the source, right, language, region, all that kind of stuff, and, and when to deliver it um, to you. So that's one thing. Another thing I want to show you is this is the little mortuary where me and Willie's family is from. 
This is a town of 5,000 people. This is one of probably three mortuaries in a town of 5,000 people. But guess what? They have a website and you can sign up for alerts. And Willie, I can see you better have already done this. If not, I'm going to pop you because you didn't know. I can see it on his face. <laughs> and so look at this. You can come over here. Every time someone passes away, I get an alert. And you can come over to view the, the details. And sometimes they don't have an obituary, but you can see the service information, right? Right here. And then, of course, people love this little tribute wall. Go over here and stock this wall. Who is writing about Mr. Joel Anthony Phoenix? And see if you can find these people on social media if they're connected to you, right? Mm -hmm. So this is another way. And here's another clue. Look at this picture. What does this picture tell you on his tribute wall? What does it say? If you have included in, there's a huge clue in this photo. This man is a graduate of Grambling University. Mm -hmm. Look at the colors, black, the good black and gold, okay? You got that Grambling G over here mm -hmm. to the right-hand side. He is clearly a distinguished alumni, and he loved them so much, so they used this picture of him on his obituary. That gives you another area to search for stuff, just in case there never is a printed obituary, and you can't, you can't uh, glean anything from this wall. Can and I this also, is in a little town of 5,000 people. So yeah. I, I just had to put that out there. Can I add just one more thing about the funeral home? So so shout out to my mom who's probably watching this time, mother. Um, my mom's a funeral director. And one of the things that I know about funeral directors is they like to talk. They like to share information. So you can call these funeral homes. Hey, tell me about Mr. I can't remember his name, so-and-so's uh, funeral or what was his service, blah, blah, blah. And they'll give you at least enough information that's within the state's laws to contact or to, to get some information. They might even send you an obituary. Mm -hmm. That is very true. That is very true. Um, so I would also, hold on. I'd also ahead. like to add too, if you're researching a deceased um, ancestor and you're looking at the funeral home, see if they'll give you the application mm -hmm. that was filled out. I, and usually, especially when you're going through funeral home records, um, have we done it? Did we do a show? Yeah, we did. Okay, because we're we're doing one about funeral homes. That one's coming up in February. But uh, those some of the older funeral homes have these gigantic books, just like you would get when you go to the mortuary or go to the court county courthouse, and they'll it's just a ledger, and it will say you know who the deceased was, where they died, who you know was in charge of the service, where they're buried, things like that. And that would be a good lead to find potentially living people. We talked about uh, printed obituaries in newspapers. We talked about the more, uh, funeral mortuary website. We talked about people finders. Uh, what other resources can you guys think of? We talked about social media. Can you think of yearbooks? Yes. Yeah. And they're putting those online now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mine's yes. exactly up there. <laughs> I know. I saw your picture. You yeah, were when I was in the color guard. Oh my goodness, I was shocked. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, I think that's absolutely right. Yearbooks are wonderful tools um, to try and track down living people, especially if you have stair step kids. I love that when you can find multiple kids of the same family in the same yearbook. Or cousins. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. or, cousins. or cousins. Exactly. What other resources can you all think of? in terms of your, your go-to stuff. Cause Alex pretty much laid out exactly what I do when I try to find people. Mm -hmm. Willie? I can't, they've already said the white pages, but they've already said it. Um, <laughs> uh, let me see. I can't think of anything else. Um, now, um, Nick, I, I have a question. Ahead. I have a yes, question. How many people have used Twitter to, to find people? I have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I found a few connections there besides, uh, as well. Yeah, besides social Instagram media. Instagram as well. Instagram as Instagram. well. Instagram, but also yes. link, LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. LinkedIn wow. is another one. That's another one. That's another one. And and how many of you, if you've messaged your uh, contact on a particular website, right? Mm -hmm. Especially if you're on Ancestry. Have you ever looked to see if they link to their social media on their profile? A lot of people do that. They yeah. will, where you can provide additional links to mm -hmm. whatever stuff you want. 
a lot of people will uh, link to their social media channels through their profile. So let's say they didn't respond to your message on Ancestry and mm -hmm. you could get to their Facebook page. They may respond more more readily if you contact them there because they check that more more frequently. Mm -hmm. True. In addition, yeah, LinkedIn is old school. That's like that's people probably forgot they even still have that on there. But that LinkedIn is like that old that old trick like the Google alerts and the eBay and all those going on. That's stuff we've had for a while. So mm -hmm. go and back I, and, and, and re look at that. <laughs> and I, I was going to add, I have another cousin in the chat room, Pat Bryant, who actually found me because I had a, a public tree on ancestry and we met immediately. And we, our first visit was to our cemetery. Um, and it's so interesting because uh, uh, through her, I get a whole nother branch. And, and now it's looking like where where uh, recently, I think it was just last week, we found uh, a person who's related to us on one of our native African side way back in Greenwich. And it, it, this person was related to something like eight or nine of are different relatives from different lines. And it was just, okay, we know who this person is and we can go back and forward this person uh, and take him back a lot further as well. So, so you know, uh, uh, I say it again, keep a minimal tree. You know, I, I just think the easier you are at finding of letting yourself out there and being seen, it will attract others to you, whether it's on Facebook, whether it's on Ancestry, you're reaching out to your DNA cousins. Just make yourself available because people are going to bring others to you. And then when you have these stories that you're telling, who doesn't want to be attached? I always say, hey, we got three underground railroads on the of people of color side and two extra on the European. Who doesn't want to be part of it? And then it just, you know, steamrolls. Yeah, I w and that's something I think we need to have a little bit of discussion on because we're all extroverts, mm -hmm. right? For some people, this may be a challenge for them to reach out to folks that they don't already know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know sure. what I mean? That might be a stretch for them. Like, we're all very audacious and bold and we don't care. We're going to come <laughs> and find you, right? But not everybody is like that. How do you get over that as a researcher? Like, and for me, I kind of feel like you kind of can't have as much success if you don't. Yeah. Definitely. What do you want? I, 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 I can't be afraid. You know, I, I, I'm always proactive in reaching out to people, how they receive the information. I'll leave it up to them. I have cousins who contact me all the time. I have cousins who, who don't, but they still want to be in the mix. I don't have a problem with that. Mm -hmm. You know, again, I I'm doing the work of my ancestors who are our ancestors and and my my uh, ultimate goal is to make our ancestors known. How you interpret and process that information, I'm less concerned with that. You know, I I'm thankful for those people who ha are working together with me to move forward on this journey. I I, I don't worry about others who might be shyer uh, than than some of us. Um, uh, I don't worry about cousins who I know love me. Who, who and who have been raised with me, who want to sit on the sidelines and just observe. I, I can't worry about that. I, I'm always thinking forward and writing my ancestors' <laughs> stories and putting them back into history. Well, I think Blaine, um, Blaine Bettinger, our friend in genealogy, also uh, is in the chat room. And he has a great suggestion about using a script, especially if you're nervous and you're calling mm -hmm. people for the first time. Mm -hmm. Write down what you want to say and mm -hmm. rehearse it beforehand so it doesn't sound like you're trying to audition for Hamilton. <laughs> I, no, I'm serious because think about it. If, if Willie called me and he said, hi, my name is Willie Russell the fourth. And I believe that we know you want it to sound genuine. Yeah. You want it to sound warm. You want it to sound inviting. It's the same way that you want to project when you're actually writing a written message, because that is also hard to decipher tone. So you want to make sure, especially if you're reaching out in written word, that you're inviting, that you're accommodating, that, that you, you don't know. The other thing is don't make assumptions about where these people are research wise. Mm -hmm. The person may not have a tree because they don't know the people. Mm -hmm. Right. They they aren't just being a jerk and just not having a tree. Right. They just they may not know 
They may not know the names. They might be adopted. They may be in foster. They may have been in foster care, or maybe a part of their family history is painful. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's the side of the family that you are related to them on. So, you know, so th these are considerations that we need to make as well when we're reaching out to living people, because we don't know the potential emotional baggage that they may carry as a result of family. And you may be the first introduction to them to a side that may have something negative associated with it. Or you may be the first exposure that they have. But, you know, these are just considerations that, um, you know, that I feel we need to make. So, you know, continuing the conversation, um, what should researchers be mindful of as they search for living relatives? Right. What are the things we should keep at the forefront of our mind? Like, you know, that we're kind of already kind of going down this road. But what what are things that we need to be mindful of? That all relatives aren't interested in knowing you. <laughs> I, 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 I was going to piggyback on that because I've had uh, experience where where where. Uh, uh, you don't want to give the impression that um, you are a stalker because I've been stalked by some people. You, 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 you have to balance people's need for privacy with just your your own needs. Um, but you can't you can't be too forceful there. You use know, discretion. <laughs> use discretion. Uh, you don't want to. I I I'm laughing because uh, you know. Um, in my former job, I was a recruiter, and 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 some of the recruiters would go out and you know they'd 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 go into social media, find out all this information, and I just wasn't ready to go there, because um, I think there 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 has to be discretion, there has to be boundaries. You do not want to come off like you're pressuring someone and you're begging them for information. That's why I I don't worry about those who don't respond. I I put it out there. I, the first thing I let people know is none of us are responsible for the acts of our ancestors. Okay, just, this is me. I, did you just say that? Well, you know, I, I, I have a whole speech, like, because I come across with people like, you know, I'm laughing because Chris is in, uh, dear cousin Chris, the first conversation I had with her, it was so hilarious because she said that she's going to laugh at this. I had nothing to do with it. I'm like, did I say you had anything to do with it? And <laughs> she then she's like, you were and calling then the about other a day. thing, and the other thing is, I hate to tell you this, but I have a potty mouth. I said, wow, I do too. And oh my still, God. Like, we, we still, I, I can't pick up the phone without dying. And laugh because Chris is just. But you, but but you bring up an important point though. Is especially when you're making contacts at first, you don't know people's personality yet. So you know, people might be put off if you curse. Or I'm not saying that you should <laughs> that you should that you should uh you know not be yourself. But you know, if you know you have a strong personality. You gotta be, you gotta be careful. And FYI, true, the chat room did hear your praise music after one of the comments. I thought, I thought that was your ringtone, but you were going, <laughs> "Hallelujah on Willie!" I am hollering, you, Lord. So clearly, we all need to get the praise uh, break. Uh, uh, thing. Uh, if you haven't seen Kev on stage, he's one of my favorite followers on Facebook. He is a comedian and he just he does commentary on videos all the time. And, and last year he had this thing where he found an app that basically you could add your own praise music. So if you decided you wanted to start hooping and hollering based on something you wanted to say, you could add in the punctuations that the band would make if you were at a church. And you, there's actually an app that you can download to do this. And apparently True has this app. This is I'm hilarious. sorry. I just had to. <laughs> but really but it's, speaking on it. <laughs> it's true. So so here's yeah. the thing, though. We got to talk mm -hmm. about the evolving role, like evolving landscape of genetic genealogy, right? Yeah. We have to have a conversation about this because so much is happening. Even today, there was an article that came out through AP on Yahoo about how GEDmatch was used to convict um, this DJ of a, of a killing in 1992. Wow. He murdered a woman in her apartment. And then you have, you know, Golden State Killer. You have all these things. And, you know, I know that I'm constantly getting questions from my family members who have tested asking how these things are taking place. Right. But this is something we have to be we have to be mindful of when we're reaching out to living people now is that folks have this concern. Right. So what are ways that you can ease your family members fears, especially if they're new to you about your contact with them? 
because these are these are just things that you just need to be. Don't all jump in. <laughs> um, I'll start. You know, I would say that um, mm -hmm. some family members are a little skittish now as a result of the Golden State Killer. But um, I just, you know, I, how I sell it to them is, you know, we finding family members. And if, a, you know, um, you, we can't worry about everything. We, we leave in footprints everywhere. So anyway, so your DNA is everywhere any, anyway. Well, I, 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 I'm very opinionated <laughs> about this. Um, I still believe in Jed Match, uh, but I, I, it, the reality is people have fears and I've said it before, you know, this whole thing can be the, have the impact that the Tuskegee syphilis experiment had on clinical research for decades. So I'm always mindful that people have their, they're going to believe what they want to believe. I can only tell them how useful it's been to me. Um, I've been able to have breakthroughs. I'm trying to, you know, make all sorts of connections through DNA as someone who is the descendant of enslaved people. Um, that being said, you know, I can say, I can tell them have it private, or I can tell them use a you use a uh, an alias or create a different surname, or I can tell them there are ways to protect yourselves. However, let's be real. If the government wants to get you, they will get you. Mm -hmm. Okay. They, so, so part of me is this, it, it, you know, um, there's now a, a hysteria over it, but we, we have to be mindful that we're not going to be able to change everybody's minds and that people have a right to their own opinion. I'm not here to change anybody on this panel or anybody listening opinion. I have my own opinion. We are not a monolithic group of panelists. Hmm. We all have different uh, uh, opinions and we have to be mindful that there are other people out there who, are, who, who believe likewise. So I respect difference. Um, I approach it as how it's helped me. And that's, that's the only thing that I'm telling people. I've been able to go back now. You want to talk about making ties? I was just December 16th at the Lost Souls Project, where we're able to look at that last slave ship, and if not the last slave ship, all five slave ships, and now know that where these folks' ancestors came from through genetic genealogy, a combination of not only autosomal, but mtDNA. So to me, it's worthwhile. But again, you know, you have to put it out there and you have to be truthful and you have to address people's concerns in a respectful manner. I Thank think you. that, I think that, that's the thing. I'm on the opposite end of the spectrum, right? Mm -hmm. Once everything came out with Jet Match, I removed my kits. I just, for me, until there's some wide sweeping standard or something to protect people on both ends, I just can't get with it. But I respect Teresa. I'm not going to argue her down and be like, build the wall. <laughs> <laughs> ah. I'm not going to do that to her about Jet Match, right? Mm -hmm. Because some people can be like, build the wall on Jet Match. Let's keep it real. We don't know how to argue. We don't know how to debate nowadays. It's either uh, all my way or the highway, right? Yeah. People, that's a critical thinking skill somehow that missed several generations in public schools, unfortunately. But I hate to say that, but it's true. But mm -hmm. at the end of the day, people have to go with what's comfortable for them. And you also have to approach reaching out to living people in the same way. There are Definitely. folks in the chat room who said that they've reached out to family members who are like, I don't want to keep in contact with folks. And you're like, but why'd you take the test? Because they wanted the percentages. They didn't want you. They, wanted, they got their own <laughs> reasons why. Yeah, and they they wanted the percentages. They didn't want you. Go ahead, Drew. I just, I'm, I'm in agreement with everybody on the panel. Like the question you asked us previously about how do you approach? Well, when I came into genealogy, I was on the voucher program. That's what I call it. My auntie <laughs> had, I had the voucher for everybody that I talked to in the family. And I have built my reputation on that. And when it comes to the DNA, it is a sensitive issue, even when it came down to my own mother. So I have to take those baby steps and I did have to, you know, take a step back and work within the DNA sites. I 
did have because all those fears that they were worrying about came true. So, you know, I had to, you know, I'm that person that they trust and that they depend on to get this done. It's, you know, two families. I'm dealing with my mother's life and I'm the first person that's doing this and keeping it organized and researching and document. So my role in my family is, you know, I'm pretty sure it's just like everybody else out there, but I really take it seriously what they ask me and how I approach them and come up to them and answer their questions. And if I'm not comfortable with it, of course, they're going to take my, you know, advice about that. So, well, and here's the other thing. If you discover that you have a family member that has a child that they adopted or that they gave, you know, they gave up and you're looking for living people and you're trying to do all this, you have to be mindful of that privacy of that known family member of yours, mm -hmm. as well as that child. What if the right. child does not want to meet their birth parent? Mm -hmm. you and know, I'm that, one of that's... those people, you know, that is an adoptee that's, you know, chocolate. <laughs> and I'm coming up as first and second cousins to, you know, people that are a hundred percent European. So I get all of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No. So here's so my last question before we move into current events is what um, are some best practices for living people searches? What what should researchers avoid at all doing at all costs? I definitely like, go ahead. I would say some things to avoid. Um, one of the things that, that I did yeah. when I was first starting off researching was I called, um, I was here in California and I was calling Owasa, Alabama, y'all Google that. Um, I was calling them off of white pages like we discussed earlier. Um, one of the things that I was not aware of was time differences at that time. So I'd be calling, you know, it'd be four o'clock here, but it's seven o'clock and I'm calling, you know, 80 plus year olds. They're laying down for bed and all that. So I made a name for myself for being that, you know, Maxine's grandson calling all times of the night, <laughs> even though it was only seven o'clock, but all times of the night. And I still hold that name to this day. Um, but then secondly would be to bring in biases or to be unaware of like biases and nuances between different sides of the family. So um, again, really young doing this, um, about 2009 or 10, um, my group on Facebook was growing and there was a few relatives, um, a few, if you know about New Orleans um, and what happened in 2005 with the hurricane, a lot of people were displaced and Facebook was still a pretty new thing. So it wasn't like the, like, you know, by 2010, not everyone still had a Facebook. Um, so I had a relative call me um, and, you know, I'm like, she's like, are you? She thought I was way older than I was. Are you this guy that's researching our family and is connecting all of us to our family members? And I said, yeah, who are you? You know, and she's like, oh, I'm so-and-so's granddaughter. But then she says, well, how are, you know, I, I asked her, well, where are your, where's your immediate family? She said, well, you are. I was unaware completely um, of the fact that she had basically lost most of her immediate family due to Katrina or aftermath, right? So being aware of some of these things is really important because people just like you are descendants from, you know, your great, great, great grand, so on and so, but also they have lived experiences and struggles just like you do. Um, all the same, our sides of the family had been beefing for almost a hundred years prior to that over skin color. So, you know, like you have to be aware of that and not bring some of those same biases. I have a, I have closer cousins. My grandma says, oh no, don't ask the so-and-sos about that because they ain't going to know that. Or don't, don't bring that up to them because it's going to stir the pot. So you have to be aware to actually not um, bring some of those biases that you've inherited. Um, and it's the same way as talking to white folks, which also could be part of tracking down descendants, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no. Any any other best practices? I think that colorism one is a very good one um, in our community that, you know, sometimes people were alienated. I know my great grandmother was alienated from her siblings because she was the darkest one out of mm -hmm. all of them. And because of that is why I don't know any, I didn't know anything about her family until DNA. Literally could not name her siblings, none of that. Knew of a sibling, but one of them came up from New Orleans to visit. They had such a horrible fight. The woman left. Nobody saw or heard from people ever again. And my great-grandmother didn't die until 1983. So that colorism thing 
can be, and if people in the family were passing and you mm-hmm. didn't know, come on now. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Here you come with your chocolate self into the scenario and they've been trying to push you back in the closet mm-hmm. for about two generations. So you don't know. We, Of course, there's no way. It's not like a person's profile on the, on the DNA side is like, has colorism issues, daddy issues, was, was you know, it, it doesn't come with that. But kind of read people as they respond to you um, mm-hmm. with messages yeah. and, and things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, anything else in terms of best practices, what people should avoid at all costs? I think don't come on too strong right. in the initial message because people will not respond. Um, I think especially like I, I just had a scenario yesterday with an adoptee who was a second to third cousin match to me. And that said that they were given up as a child. And um, I responded. I'm this cousin to you. Um, I would love to contact you. Um, I'm pretty sure I know who one of your parents is because it's one of my second cousins. And here's my phone number and here's my email. That's it. I didn't have to lay out 150 things. Anika, I was going to piggyback on that is um, I think it's so important if someone reaches out to you, whether it's on Ancestry or any of the DNA sites that you respond back. Um, even I, I can't tell you how many uh, uh, DNA cousins I have who are adoptees. And I don't, I don't, if you're dealing with Puerto Ricans, we're very endogamous and whatever. All I can do is what I tell everybody. I'm willing to share my tree with you. Uh, you can see who we have in common. And this is what I know. I, I tend to be the one always offering because I, I want to give them you know, whatever, if, if you want to continue the conversation, we can, but I'm just trying to help you or help whenever. So I think it's just common courtesy is to write back, even if you don't know anything mm-hmm. and acknowledge this person. Cause this person is a person. Willie. <laughs> um, well, let's see. One, one, one thing that I think I can say is I guess go into it without having too many emotions because I know sometimes when you get the door slammed in your face, you can feel some type of way because I know I did. But um, you got to go into it with a blank slate and you know, just go in it with the best hopes. That's the uh, the chat rooms have some really good suggestions. Um, Terry Ligon says if you're having conversations with elders, make them regular conversations once a mm-hmm. month and keep notes. Absolutely, that's something I started early on in my process, and I kept them in spiral bound notebooks. And then eventually, I actually transcribed them into a document so that if something happens, it's living in the cloud. Um, it's mm-hmm. got the date, the person's name. I literally use their language. I didn't use my language um, mm-hmm. because you can try mis- misconstrue things, you know, just from your own perception, just write down exactly what they said. And that has been a huge help uh, research wise. Um, Regular contact is good because these older folks, you know, they may not have grandchildren or children that come to check on them, you know, and you may be the only person that is calling them because maybe all their friends have passed away. So you showing an interest in them is is huge. Um, it's very huge. Um, uh, people talking about uh, uh, C. Davis says pre-plan how you will answer difficult questions, um, mm-hmm. which is true because if you call these elders, they're gonna say who are your people. They're gonna mm-hmm. want to know, right? Yeah. Gonna I would also know. add. I would also add use etiquette when you go. Mm-hmm. Um, when you're when you're writing and you're taking notes, let them know what you're doing. And don't always focus on writing so much, but kind of keep that eye contact. Mm-hmm. So you, they feel like they're a part of the conversation and you're not there just to squeeze information out of them and bounce. Mm-hmm. Don't don't look like a drive-by. Don't be doing <laughs> drive-by genealogy. Come and spray the people up and leave, right? <laughs> you, you siphon all your information out of them and you haven't said anything about yourself. And you know, and that's just that to me, that's home training. You don't mm-hmm. ever go and request about somebody's life like that and not provide something in reciprocity, right? May, you know, I'm, I always talk about I'm not above food. Bake a cake, get a pie, make a, a banana pudding, bring them a copy of your family history book as a thank you, mm-hmm. right? You want, they're spending, they're taking time out of their day for you. And there has research. to be a benefit for them. What do There's they get out of the deal? There has to be a mm-hmm. benefit. 
We and do I, not want to do drive-by genealogy. Let's go yeah. ahead and coin that term. Like That's we real. coined crew, we're going to coin drive-by genealogy. Mm -hmm. A lot of folks are very selfish. They just want the names and the dates and that's it. They don't want the relationships. Come on now. Yeah. Hey, 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 I got my doctor vestry to prove. I was just, yeah. you know, you yeah, got to build those relationships and build that trust and talk to them all through you, the year. Yeah, I might you. call my 90 year old second cousin, but and he repeats the same thing, but I call him once a month, just like Aunt uh, Velma. She let me tell you something, anymore, but you, you want to get your elders to the point or mm -hmm. your living people to the point where they have a notebook that's just for you, yes. where they have gone to the 99 cent store, Dollar Tree, Dollar General, Walmart, and they have this little mm -hmm. tiny notebook that's for Alex. Anytime I think of something that I forgot to tell Alex the last time, I'm going to write it down in here so that when he calls me once a month, I can go back through and say, you know what? I forgot to tell you about, about yeah. cousin Michael. He got hit by a train. I, I forgot about that. I, it was, I was seven years old when it happened. The and primer. if they can't afford to get a notebook, <laughs> send them one. In fact, why don't you mm -hmm. be all in your stuff? Y'all know how you can brand things easily now. Why don't you go to Shutterfly or one of these yes. sites some branded little notebooks that says notes for Linda. I just did that. And, and send it <laughs> out to your relatives well, you taught so us they could put, <laughs> they could put it right in there. Help That's very real. I want to throw something in too. Yeah. Um, one of the things as far as best practices goes, I really think that it's important that we consider what you know, if we're talking, if we're reaching out to someone we've never heard of or, mm -hmm. you know, whatever the case is, I think it's very important that we try to take into consideration the ancestor's life that uh, that we're trying to research or that this person may be a descendant of. So, for instance, if there's some spat in the family that you may not even know about, you're contacting this person. This can bring back some really deep trauma to them. we was talking this about earlier, yeah. You know, it's it's mm -hmm. very, very, very important. I may have missed that because I had to step away for a second. But I think that, um, that that's something to consider. And then especially knowing exactly your intention on going. Are you going to be that armchair genealogist? Are you going to be do, doing the drive-by, as Nika says? Um, or are you actually going to build these bonds back together and make that your point? I feel like those are some very, very um, mm -hmm. strong things to empower us to go in and make these connections because it can be it can be a very daunting task and we all and I, yeah i just can't do it i cannot be black and white it's always some emotional tinge to everything i'm doing especially when i'm talking to my family members it's just i can't explain it it's just something there that when you get with them one-on-one -on -one or you're with five people or i talk meet 15 new people at a reunion just off the top because because of course I got my crew that I hang with and then my other, the elders, but then I make it a point to meet five or 10 new people every time that come. Well, I, I, I was going to add here because you all want to make me cry because I, think, <laughs> I, I go back and I think of my cousin Helen from my mother's side. The first mm -hmm. time she met me, she said, I told you, she said she could die in peace. And whenever we mm -hmm. were together and even for her 100th birthday, I was the, first relative she met since the age of five. Oh. And here I am asking her to do DNA test, asking this. And I told her, I'm going to write a story about your Blanchard line. Mm -hmm. I said, them, yeah, and I said, them. after you pass, I said, mm -hmm. you're going to be, you're always, I was your cousin Teresa from your mother's side. You're my cousin Helen from my mama's mm -hmm. side too. And, I, and, 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 and he, we exchanged gifts, whatever. And I stood up at her funeral mm -hmm. and I, I, I can't be sad. I was blessed with three years. Mm -hmm. you know? well, and you, you and made the blessing. effort beyond drive by genealogy. Mm -hmm. right? Of course, that's why I'm saying it. it, it there's yeah. a blessing there and, and you can't just keep stuff to yourselves. Mm -hmm. Yes. So because there's a there's a level of reaching out and reaching in that has to happen, mm -hmm. whether it it's to. To deceased people and especially living people. Mm -hmm. Anything else before we go into viewer comments and ask Mariah? Because I forgot to mention that before, and the chat room almost fell out into a, a hissy fit. <laughs> I didn't say we were having asked Mariah. <laughs> 
anything else you guys want to wrap it up? I think we've had a really good discussion. Um, we've definitely so. given you a lot of tools and things. Um, Felicia says, sometimes less is more. I sit with the elders and let them converse with each other. Mm -hmm. Tea mm -hmm. and treats will spill. They think I'm on Facebook because I seem uninterested, but I'm note taking. You better say that, girl. Come on. Now, she also says that we need to put together little Black Pro Gen notebooks like this so we can you can give okay. them a yep. yeah. um, you know, that say notes for and then you can have a name put on there, um, which I think, like I said, that's that's a good idea. And and you all, the notes that I took in those notebooks, I would say 90% of the people that I interviewed are dead now. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, even if it was one thing that I wrote on a post-it note, it didn't matter what it was, I just all just kept it all. And, and a lot of that stuff is really bearing fruit for me now. Mm -hmm. So um, I would definitely say that. Um, yeah. So Oh, gosh, this is a really good conversation. All right, so let's move into viewer comments because they had some off the chain ones that they were giving us tonight. All right, I think this is Arjuri because their last, the first name is A and the last name is McCray. <laughs> um, I started out with the living since we have been having reunions for 65 plus years. I personally knew many of the living folks. Wow, I think that's an admonishment. If you haven't started having a reunion, have a reunion because when you get to be much older, you can have an archery who doesn't necessarily have to go out on Facebook to try and find living family members, right? Okay, so Charlotte Chatfield, she says, uh, relatives, a few counties over helped me with information. It was great because I found people who finally look like me and my dad. I just met cousins in Philly recently that I found by DNA. Also, our friend in genealogy, uh, Blaine Bettinger, says he loves the neighbor mention. He said he was delivering groceries to a nursing home and he got to talking and the lady dated his great uncle and knew his great, great grandparents. So that mm -hmm. that totally goes to the the mantra of talk to people, open yourself up, stop, you know, operating in your being an armchair genealogist, not getting out, re meeting people and doing all that kind of stuff. So. All right, you guys, it's time for your favorite part of the show. Black Pro Gen Life's Ask Mariah. This is the part of the show where you, the viewers, submit your questions, queries, conundrums, and more to the panel. And we wait in live with research help specifically geared toward you. Panelists never see the queries beforehand, so you get a chance to see us work together live to help our Genia Buzz get past their brick walls. Tonight's query is from... Adrian Anderson. Hey, Adrian, if you're in the chat room, wave your little hand so we can see you. Just go ahead and wave it. All right. She says that she is searching for her maternal third great grandparents. Her uh, great great grandfather's name was Tom Pulliam. He was born in Dalton, Georgia around 1854 and died in Brownsville, Tennessee in 1941. Haywood County, stand up. Carmen, come on through in the chat room because Carmen is in there. Her folks are from Brownsville. It's the county next to mine. All right. So we've got Tom Pulliam, uh, Dalton, Georgia uh, around 1854 died Brownsville, Tennessee, 1941. Per the 1880 census, his father was born in North Carolina. She wasn't able to find Tom on the 1870 census, and she's sure that his parents and possibly other family members would have been listed. Tom would have been around 15 or 16 years old. So she's got him on the 1880 census. Um, she doesn't say where, but she says she's found him, that he was, that it says uh, his father was born in North Carolina. This is on the 1880 census. She wasn't able to find him in 1870, and she's sure his parents and possibly other family members would have been listed. So he would have been about 15 or 16 at the time. All right, next slide. The only thing that came across um, was her great grandfather's World War I draft card, uh, which gave Tom's place of birth, which, which of course would be uh, where his parents are. And she says she's taken Ancestry DNA and 23andMe. So I'm sort of confused by the Tom, the father's place of birth listed on the draft card. Um, typically, it's the wherever the the draftee was born so i don't i'm not sure if that was a uh i don't know if that was a, a, a typo or or what um okay so let's see i don't know i don't see her in the chat room oh maybe she is okay sorry um she's there yes, adrian I is here yeah mm -hmm. she is here i see her okay okay so we've got tom Birth date about 1854. We know that he died in 1941 in Brownsville, Tennessee. FYI, that's Haywood County, right outside of Memphis. 
right next to uh, Hardeman County and Fayette County and Madison County. Those are the surrounding counties for that area. Um, you've got uh, 1880 census, no 1870. Could you tell us where you found him in 1870 or 1880 rather? Um, because I'm thinking um, Pulliam was definitely butchered on a census. It may not be, it may not reflect the same spelling or since we're talking about the time period after slavery, he, uh, he could have gone by a different name as a newly emancipated person. What do you all think? Quiet, quiet, quiet. Uh, that definitely could be could be altered from like Pullman. It could be all kinds of different name variations. But I think that one of the things we need to try to track is his migration from Georgia to Tennessee and see who came with him. Um, there are death records available. Um, Family search. And I believe Ancestry, they also have uh, Tennessee death records. So I found them in nineteen in 1900 in pretty much all um, subsequent census. Um, I haven't looked at the image yet, but this is given enough information for us to be able to find some parents. His parents should be in that generation that was born probably around like 1820-ish, so they may have survived slavery because he certainly did. Yeah. Um, she says she doesn't know if he was in Tennessee in 1880 or in Georgia. Um, let's see. Let me pull up Tennessee records on family search as well. Anybody else have any questions while we're kind of trying to dig in and get more information? What's the what's the year again? Is there a year? She said 1941 was the death, and I want to say 1854. I was trying to write kind of quick. I know she said Memphis for 1941 was the was death. <laughs> <laughs> I know I need a separate screen just for <laughs> the Asperia slides. So, Nika, just to go back to what you said about the name spelling. Um, with the name spelling, you have in 1900, it's listed with a Y in place of the I. So it could be, could definitely be an, an alteration. Um, but I did find an 1870 census that's, that has Thomas Pullum. It's in Bradley County, Tennessee. Does anybody have a, a map open? Uh, that, that ain't close. It's not close at all. Nah, I'm. You know, I'm like, I'm sitting right where you. This is an hour away from where I live. Um, Lord, I don't think okay. Bradley County is close to here. Okay. Well, um, there is. See, hold on. Let me. This might be in East. Is this? Yeah, it's near. That's near Chat. It's in East okay. Tennessee. Okay, yeah. so there's some distance covered, but I do want to point out something. In 1870, there is a household, a farm of uh, sharecroppers headed by, I think the man's name is maybe Lawson. Um, Lawson, who's 50, making him 1820, like we said earlier, and Roseanne, his wife. Um, inside of the household are several children, one of them being Thomas, who's 13, which kind of matches the age range. Also a uh, farm laborer, but born in, in Georgia. The parents were both listed as born in North Carolina. So this does follow some of what, um, Thomas gives in these repeated records about having a North Carolina tie. Okay. I did I'm find this link over to y'all. Yeah, I did find his uh death certificate. Um, I think one thing that we could that she could potentially do if she doesn't have any leads on other family members, um, my question is, has she searched out this cemetery in Brownsville to see if other family members are buried there? Um, or looked for additional death certificates in Brownsville for people with the same surname. Um, you've got an informant of Dan Pulliam here, um, and he he's enlisted in Woodlawn Cemetery. It also gives you district number nine, so that would kind of tell you where to look on a map. Um, they don't have any information in terms of his spouse. It says just widower. 
um, it, no information for parents, um, even a birth location just says, don't know, don't know. So Dan clearly is a, probably a family member of his, but mm -hmm. if, even he did not know mm -hmm. where uh, he was from. Can um, I, go ahead. Can I jump in one more time? So I looked, I did a, a quick search of 1900 census um, results around where, um, ta where Tom was living with his wife. Mm -hmm. in family. And there is one man who's slightly younger than Tom um, named Benjamin Pulliam. And I found him in 1880, on the 1880 census with none other than that same Lawson Pulliam and they're in Haywood, Tennessee. Mm, okay. Send. Did you? Oh, you posted the link. Okay. I, was I posted say the 1870. I think that this one here is the 1880. Okay. It may be the same one. Let me uh, let me make sure. Oh, I'm gonna post. I'm gonna send you this uh, link to. The okay, ATV. so I see the it 1900. Is. Okay, and then you've got this second one that is. I think you said is 1880. Yeah, that one may be wrong. This one, the second, the last one that I just sent you is from 1880 for sure, and it's the image. Okay. Sorry, because it kind of jumbled together. I noticed that if you just hover over it towards the bottom, it'll separate the, the two. Yeah, that's what that's what I was doing. Okay, okay. I got you. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. All right, we are here together. Okay. Aww. So, all right, so you've got the 1880 in Haywood. There's a loss in Pulliam, and you're saying that the record that you found in East Tennessee is the same person. It's the person with the same name. Yes. Okay. Okay, so let me um, let me go ahead and show this to everybody, because mm -hmm. um, this because we're looking Excuse for Tom, who was listed underneath, right? Mm -hmm. He is. Uh, let's see, Tom Pulliam is right here, and then you have a Lawson Pulliam, mm -hmm. who is who is a couple households over on the same census page, and this is in uh, this is in Haywood County, Tennessee. Um, and Adrian, of course, Carmen is dominating the chat room because Carmen is research here. And I'm like, you just need to talk. You need to talk to Carmen offline, oh, basically. Huh. Um, yeah. And there's a, there's a birth location of North Carolina for this loss in Pulliam there. Now, when you go to Tom here, age 26, he, you have a Georgia birth location for him and a North Carolina for his father. If this were me, I would have just assumed that Lawson was his father or some sort of a family member because of the close proximity of these people. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think it's a stretch to assume that um, by any means. Um, he's got a wife who was born in Tennessee. And then you look at Tom here and his mother was born in Tennessee. The states of birth match up. It's just that you know, you're dealing with two different households. So I would vet Lawson. I would try to find him. In fact, because he has a distinctive first name that is more likely not to be misspelled than Pulliam, I would just look for Lawson's in Haywood County in 1870. If not, vet that link. Um, the, you said the 1871 was the first link you posted, mm -hmm. Alex? Yes. Okay. okay, I'll put that up as well. Um... Okay, here it is. Yeah, and the other thing is, you need to do some local research too, uh, because that may be um, that may be where your clues lie. I would also suggest the Freedmen's Bureau. I'm not sure exactly how uh, together they are um, when it comes to that. Uh, I don't know. You know, use the Mapping the Freedmen's Bureau website. Um, we actually did an entire episode on the Freedmen's Bureau last year, um, last season, last season. Um, I'll find that episode. Yeah, if we can post that in the chat room along with the Tennessee episode. We also did a Tennessee episode as well during season four. Um, I would, let's see, hold on, chat room. Okay, let me go back. Uh, lots of history. Okay, Lawson Pulliam, 1851, birthplace, North Carolina. Um, the tree I'm looking on Ancestry belongs to, okay, so I think they found her tree on Ancestry. Um, let's see. Shelly kept reporting something about the son's name was Dan, so I don't. Yeah, I don't okay, so Carmen's saying a research trip. 
Apparently, Carmen, I, 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 yeah, okay, she says the Freedmen's Bureau wasn't very good in Haywood. Um, Lawson Pulliam was married in Caswell, North Carolina. His spouse was Hera Fuller. How do we, wait a minute, how do we get there? Oh, okay. Renata says she looked at her tree and she said, then she already has all this on her tree. Adrian, the name you have as Lawrence is actually Lawson. I oh. looked at the actual document. So, okay. So she already had the person. She just didn't know she did. Lord, today, that's what had, that's what had happened. Sometimes it does now. Um, and so Dante, uh, Asks, is there anything on Lawson Pulliam? Um, anyone in her family with the name Lawson? And she said, no, nobody has that name. Um, yeah, she. Uh, they also suggested checking the Bureau of Land Management site, but that's down because of the government shutdown. So once the government gets back up, that's a great suggestion. Um, True was going to post the links to the Tennessee show along with the Freedmen's Bureau show. Um, I think I think this record that you found is is right. And I think that, um, I think that this, this, I think Lawson is the father. I think it's they're, they're, they're in too close proximity for it not to be. Um, it's just, yeah, to me, it's just, yeah. Let's see anything else. Um, Okay, Renata says she found her tree, um, but it's her tree and she already has these names. Yes, that's fine, but maybe she wasn't sure that she had the right information or that she should be going off the right inferences. There's nothing wrong with that. Anybody else have anything you want to add for suggestions? Um, I did notice in that, in that 1900 census um, that their family was basically renting land or working la working on the land of a white man. Um, and he, at this point, he's named. But I don't. I'm not. I don't know um, at this point his name anymore, unless I go back to the record. But I would also suggest looking at that 1880 census. I can't stand 1880 census that has that no household listed thing. Um, but I would go and try to figure out like the different designations between farmer and farm laborer in that area and see if they were working on consolidated property of their own or if they were working on um, a former plantation or whatever the case is. And that'll give you a little more information. Um, and doing that the same on the, uh, on the 1870 census as well. Look also, I would look to see how many other people moved from that first county in 1870 over to Haywood um, to see if they could be potential relatives or if we can figure out why they all moved over there. Yeah, um, a lot of there is a ton of people from, especially from Virginia, um, that moved to West Tennessee. Um, mm -hmm. Huge populations, and and also North Carolina as well. Um, I would suggest doing the uh, family if you have a county history, looking up that name. But I think also head to the family history center. Do that catalog search. I'm always telling people to do. See what they have, and look through uh, look through the local records to see the the trail that they left behind. You know, we have to get out of this mode of oh, if I can't get to the 1870 census, that everything's done for. You know what I mean? That's not true. There's so much available that's on site. Have you checked newspapers? Have you checked? Uh, uh, we talked about going to that cemetery, which Carmen says she has family members that are there too, to see if there's a record of burials there. There may be other Pulliams that are there. But at this point, we're really working on the theory that Lawson is his father. And by virtue of Lawson being his father, that would also mean um, that uh, the woman that was in the household with Lawson named Judy would be his mother. Um, so, um, I'm looking at the chat room. Um, we talked about labor contracts. Uh, Carmen says that Bertie County, North Carolina has a ton of people in Haywood County. So that will be a North Carolina tie. Although he did, he is listed as being born in Georgia. Now, Georgia is right next to Tennessee in, in, in particular, East Tennessee is just North of Georgia. So, um, that might be the reason why, but you know, we never know. How consistent is he listing his place of birth over census records and other records? Um, also check the mortality schedules. That's what Shelly says. Um, anything else before we wrap up into current events? All right, well, Adrian, you extra work cut out for you. You need to go local. You need to research out, meaning the other descendants of, of uh, Tom, um, 
see if you can get access to their DNA results to compare your, your different DNA matches, identify the folks who are descendants from Tom Pulliam in your matches to see if you guys triangulate to somebody who may make that connection with you through DNA. Um, and yeah, you, you got, you got your work cut out for you. You really do. <laughs> mm. All right. Let me go back to our slides. Okay. Let's see. All right. So if you have a research brick wall and you'd like help from Black Progen scaling that wall, submit your query today for our Ask Mariah segment. The link is in the description of each and every episode of Black Progen Live. Remember to be specific very specific. You see tonight we had to ask her where on 1880 she found them, right? Um, be sure to tell us everything you search so we don't duplicate efforts. And if you get selected, cross your fingers. When you press submit, you just may get chosen for one of our upcoming episodes. All right. For current events, Gender X, New York City adds gender neutral option to birth certificates. New York City now offers a gender neutral option on birth certificates for residents who don't identify as male or female. It's called X. As of this week, adults over 18 can alter their birth certificates to X so long as they attest via a form that the change is to reflect my true gender identity. New York Mayor Bill de Blasio signed the move into law Tuesday. To, quote, to all trans and non-binary New Yorkers, we see you, we hear you, we respect you, the mayor said last week on Twitter. Starting in 2019, all New Yorkers will be able to change their gender on birth certificate to M, F, or X without a doctor's note. Before 2014, New York City let people alter their gender on birth certificates only after gender reassignment surgery. After that, a doctor's note was required. Now parents can choose X for their children and adults can select the marker for themselves as long as they attest the change is, quote, not for any fraudulent purpose that form states. New York City joins California, Oregon, and Washington as places offering a gender neutral option on birth certificates. New Jersey will follow suit in February. A person may choose X on a birth certificate, but not a state driver's license. Interesting. Very, very interesting. Yeah. It's All right. Next current event. Uh, Amendment removes blood quantum requirement. Cherokee Nation celebrates the Stigler Act Amendments of 2018, becoming an official law after the President of the United States signed the bill earlier this week. Enrolled tribal citizens of the five tribes can now inherit their families' allotted land and keep it in restricted fee status without having to meet a required blood quantum. Ooh, Ooh. we. Ooh. Yeah, oh Lord, we could have a whole episode with this. Um, the Stigler Act, really? yeah, the Act Amendments of 2018 requires one half degree of Indian blood quantum requirement that was part of the original law passed in 1947. Quote, we're so thankful our leaders in Washington understood what this amended law means for our people and the and land base and that they took action during what was the right, what was right, doing what was right for the five tribes in Indian country, said Principal Chief Bill John Baker. Our families have a right to pass their lands onto their heirs and hold onto these historically significant families connections. The bill unanimously passed the House of Representatives on December 20th and cleared the U.S. Senate last month. The law, the new law signed by the president is a remedy to a huge injustice that has led to a devastating loss of land over the last seven decades. This will not reverse any of the past, but it will help prevent any, any more of our Cherokee tribal land from falling out of restricted status. Cherokee Nation's Vice President of Government Relations, Kim Teehee, said, we cannot overemphasize what this means for our tribal citizens. As Cherokees, we treasure the restricted land allotments and the link they represent to both our families and our tribe. I could say so much. Just know that we're having a five civilized tribe track at Maggie in 2019 in July. Uh, Angela, go ahead and post the link. All right, moving forward. Ha um, <laughs> let's see, uh, American Evolution uh, 2019.com and also commemorate 2019 on Twitter. Also Hampton V8 uh, 2019 Twitter account are two websites to get information um, throughout season five of Black Progen. We're going to be posting events and whatnot for the commemoration of the two, uh, 2019 first African arrivals in Virginia. So be sure to plug in to that so you know uh, what's going on. There's stuff happening all over the place. Um, it's yeah. Just be sure to plug into that. There's a lot of 1619 stuff that's going on um, on uh, in commemoration. All right. Have you checked out all the subjects we'll be covering during season five? This is just the first episode. We're going to hit 100 episodes this season. 
crazy, absolutely crazy. Yes, just crazy. Um, go ahead and head to whosneekasmith.com for a downloadable and printable schedule to make sure that you don't miss your reminders. All right, be sure to tune into the long running <laughs> research of the National Archives and Beyond, hosted by Black Pro Gen Life panelist Bernice Bennett this Thursday, January 10th. The topic is The Emancipation of Sage with Doris Keevan Frank. The enslaved uh, of the Keithley Plantation were buried on a a uh, small one acre uh, plot of land known today as Sage Chapel Cemetery. The owner of the adjoining land was a German immigrant abolitionist, Arnold Kreckel, who came to America in 1832. On January 11th, 1865, Kreckel would be, the would be the president of the Missouri's Constitutional Convention who would sign the Missouri Emancipation Proclamation that freed the enslaved that were buried at Sage Chapel Cemetery and across the entire state of Missouri. Today, this beautiful graveyard still exists in the city of O'Fallon, Missouri, and is being placed on the National Register of Historic Places. This is the research behind the story and some of the stories that come from that research. Also, be sure to check out the African Roots podcast hosted by Black Pro Gen Life panelist Angela Walton Raji. Visit African Roots podcast for her episode archive. Our next episode, number 75. If you've hit a dead end in your research and you're not quite sure how to get past it, a research trip to your ancestral location is just a thing for you. Yes, Adrian, we are talking to you. And everybody else who thinks you can find stuff just on a computer, get up off your desk, no drive-by genealogy, go do a research trip. In episode 75, we'll cover county slash parish courthouses, how they're organized, what it's like to visit a state archives or repository, how you can best prepare before getting to either location, and what you should expect and more. Join us for getting the most from your research trip, Tuesday, January 22nd, 6 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Central, 9 p.m. Eastern. Following that, Reconstruction was a pivotal time in American history that often gets overlooked, especially in genealogy. During episode 76, we'll discuss how the law and shifting community dynamics affected our ancestors on both sides of the aisle and resulted in restrictions enacted as a response. Join us for Reconstruction in the Aftermath named Jim Crow on Tuesday, February 5th, 6 p.m., 8 p.m., 9 p.m., and that will kick off our Black History Month series. All right. Any last mm. words before we go? <laughs> no. We're good. Just Nothing. thank you. Just <laughs> <laughs> do you want to hand up hand it off or you want yeah, to I'm handing off. Or I'm we handing off. do all of us together? You hand it well, off? No, I'm handing off. All I'm right. handing off. <laughs> <laughs> Let the mic go. <laughs> So we just want to thank everybody for coming out to our first episode, even though it is actually episode 74, season five. But we just appreciate you all coming in from wherever you're at and just spread the word. Drop us a hit or a comment uh, over on Twitter at Black Pro Gen or, you know, come on in our Facebook page. I'll have to drop that link in there, too. So we'll see you all next uh, in a, what is it? The week before after yeah <laughs> for ep episode 75 so we'll see you all then and we just want to thank you and good night <laughs> good night everyone all right black protein black protein black protein black protein hello everybody out there black protein black protein unapologetic black and people of color viewpoint the place where evidence tells the stories.